Hey everybody, coming up on the Cutting Edge Podcast, this episode is focused on DCD heart transplant with Dr. Brian Lima from Medical City Heart Hospital in Dallas. Stay tuned. For me, I'm very much, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, here's a problem, let's, let's take care of it. I have a solution for that. Our goal when we opened was to provide the highest quality care that was possible at a price people could afford. I literally talk to physicians daily. Kelly, I can't uh, even log in to see my own billing. I have no idea what's going on. I get a report once a month and nobody can explain it to me. I make it a point to train the physicians how to go and pull their own report. I'm gonna be on the course reporting tomorrow afternoon. You are. I am, I'm gonna follow Jordan Spieth and Will Zalatoris and Scotty Scheffler. I'm not really reporting, but I am going to go watch the part. <laughs> Probably drink a couple of beers. Yeah, too. I might have a beer or two uh, tomorrow <laughs> afternoon. I mean, that would make my commentary even better. Well, hey, everybody. Welcome to uh, what is officially episode two of season two of the Cutting Edge podcast uh, here in Dallas, Texas at the Real News Studios. We're, uh, we are really blessed to be joined by a... Uh, a heck of a person, a heck of a surgeon, just one of my favorite guests to date, to be honest with oh, you, because because well, uh, the topic is fascinating to me. It's, it's a little bit of weird science uh, mixed <laughs> in. But uh, yeah. before we get started, uh, just a quick introduction here is Dr. Brian Lima uh, to my right and uh, my trusty co-host, Tyler Tom back. back in the saddle. <laughs> I'm back. It's good to be back. Sorry, so, I missed uh, episode one. I, I I hated to miss it. Well, you know, sometimes little kids trump like they, trump everything. They else, do you know? do that. <laughs> Newborns do that. That's a legitimate excuse. I guess. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so before we get started, uh, just share a little bit about who helps support us. So we've got Texas Assist Surgical Assist Staffing. Thanks to them, uh, Carrington Advisors, which is Tyler's group. Uh, many thanks to you guys for continuing to support the cause. Um, and then this month, the Hand and Shoulder Center of Fort Worth. So actually, our, our guest on the last show uh, who talked about wide awake surgery, mm. um, a totally interesting topic in orthopedics, you know, different uh, yeah. different realm of medicine. But they they also uh, helped us out. And then uh, you know, we'd love to have all of you that are listening in connect with us in all of our social media channels. So whether it's Facebook and LinkedIn, you can follow us there. Uh, Twitter at TCE Med Pod. Uh, Instagram, The Cutting Edge Pod, and YouTube. Subscribe to our channel. We're nearing 100 subscribers. Wow. A whole hundred. Wow. Big time. So then that our is, goal is to amazing. multiply. We don't, we don't TikTok, though. I just want to make no, sure everybody knows know. that. No. <laughs> no TikToking. Yeah. Yeah. No TikTok, no Snapchat. No Snapchatting. Yep. I'm too over that, too. <laughs> good, good. Can't get into it. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, man, now that we've kind of gotten through that, uh, so topic of the day today is heart transplants. And in particular, the topic is DCD heart transplants. So without further ado, uh, back to our guest here, Dr. Brian Lima. Uh, Doc, thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. Um, Thank you for having me. It's great. Happy we could finally make this thing happen. So uh, just a little precursor here that Dr. Brian Lima is a surgical director of heart transplant and mechanical circulatory support at Medical City Heart Hospital in Dallas. How do you all fit that on a card? In really, really small print. <laughs> a couple lines. Yeah, a has to roll lines. to the back. Yeah. Turn right. over. <laughs> <laughs> I wish it wasn't so long. I wish it could be just, you know, MCS is what I typically say. But Gotcha. Uh, CJ, you said you were excited about the show. If it's half as good as the last 20 minutes pre-show with him, I mean, we're on an unbelievable track. Oh, dude, I mean, for this sure. Is, this oh, is mind-blowing stuff. Less. Laugh. Yeah, <laughs> not a laughing subject, but no, no. you know this. I think part of our goal here on the show is for this to be more uh, more targeted at the average Joe, aka sure. Tyler. That's why Tyler, you're here, right? Not yeah. not uh, not in the medical field. So yeah, you make sure you help reel us back in if we have to be. Yeah, but, very uh, very average, very average, and I embrace that. So so it's good to be here. You know, Doctor Lima, I think a great place for us to start is to have our audience get to know you. Okay. Learn a little bit about where you grew up, uh, kind of what what drew you to medicine, sure, and uh, where you did your training. So uh, I grew up 
born and raised in New Jersey, Kearney, New Jersey, right outside of uh, New York City. And uh, my, my family were uh, Cuban immigrants, so grew up speaking Spanish at home and stuff. And um, I got interested in the idea of medicine uh, early on. My dad had a heart attack when I was 10 years old. Uh, he did okay, but that really scared me, yeah. scared us, right? So it sort of got me thinking about healthcare at that time. And then uh, it wasn't really until I got to actually get further immersed in the medical field, uh, doing some rotations and shadowing that my love at first sight was surgery. You know, it was like one of those like epiphany moments, got a, a chance to scrub in. I was like, okay, I'm either going to pass out mm. or, <laughs> or love it. And I loved it. And so then it kind of evolved from there into heart surgery. Um, I just, in medical school, those, were the physicians I looked up to the most. I, I thought, you know, it's the longest period of training, the most intense, the most high risk. Uh, and I just thought watching them, this the skill level and the, you know, the dexterity and just the flow, I was just in awe. So I was like, I wanna I wanna do what that guy does. So okay, so so post undergrad, how many years of training to be a cardiac surgeon? Well, you uh after four years of college, you know, four years of medical school, it was 10 years of, uh, of training because it's changed somewhat now, but uh, in the system that I went through, you first had to fully train in general surgery. So, okay. which, you know, abdominal surgery, you know, gallbladders and all that stuff. So that's normally five years. Where I trained at Duke, they also made us do two years of research kind of thrown in the mix. So it's seven years plus the three years on top of just dedicated heart you know, chest surgery training, cardiothoracic surgery. Did you, did you come from a hierarchy of, of folks in the medical field? Did family members in, in this? Or? No, not at all. My dad uh, worked in a pigment factory uh, in uh, North New Jersey, horrible conditions, didn't speak any English. Yeah. Uh, my mother had a high school education, but, uh, you know, it was the hard work ethic thing sure. that, that was passed down. And so, and, you know, that chip on my shoulder where, hey, you know, we, we've been through a lot to get, you know, you to this point, uh, nothing is beyond your reach if you work hard enough. So that was kind of hammered in and uh, it was it was tough. I mean, it was never easy. You know, we were talking before the, yeah. before we started. I was yeah. never the smartest kid in any of my classes, but I outworked everybody. So, well, it's it's pretty tough to be the smartest kid in your class when you got in medical school. You got 10 from Harvard, 10 from Yale. Yeah. yeah. Right. And that's 10, no exaggeration. Brown, that like. Was, <laughs> yeah. And, and here he is, he's like talking, you know, he, he, you think he's from, you know, the slum from Cornell and it's like, huh? <laughs> yeah, I was like, yeah, you know, a couple of Cornell. Yeah, and I'm from so, Cornell, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah they, we managed to, you know, squeak in the back door. So to speak. But. Well, that's, uh, that's pretty interesting. So, you know, just digging in a little bit further, yeah. right? You go into your residency at Duke. Was cardiothoracic surgery early? during your clinical rotations? Was it towards the end? I mean, where, where did it kind of land in that? So uh, I knew I wanted to be a heart surgeon going into residency. Uh, I did uh, time in research and also shadowed, you know, folks in you know, my rotations, I, you know, as a medical student. So, and Duke is one of these places where it's kind of very heart surgery strong and always has been. And so literally, even though I was general surgery, I did a lot of heart surgery during my general surgery uh, residency. So my first year of residency, you know, normally you're kind of a, a month here, a month there. I was on heart surgery for six months. <laughs> really? Yeah. So it was almost like a heart surgery training before the heart surgery training kind of thing. Yeah. So how does that work? Right. I mean, yeah. the average audience member, even me, you know, obviously you're in residency, you're in training. But yeah. my thought was, hey, I'm always with this group of this physician and you know it's always scheduled were you just jumping in surgeries like being invited in to to have a chance at it and scrub in or what was yeah, that yeah like? i mean uh, early on when i was primarily you know it's a hierarchy and graduated responsibility so in the early years of residency usually you're doing a lot of for lack of a better word clerical you know taking care of folks that have already been operated on things like that yeah. but uh if you show enthusiasm and i did uh in, you know, you sneak in to help close a case or they'll call you. And, and the more that you do, the, you know, if you stay late to help out or if you were up all night and you kind of say, hey, you know, I don't want to go home yet. I'll can I come help you with a surgery kind of thing. So little by little, those things start to add up. And uh, 
you get noticed as far as, hey, okay, this guy's interested. Let's, and they love that because they're like, you know, heart surgery and surgeons in general, like they can't understand why anybody else wouldn't want to do what they do. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like, again, this all or nothing mentality. So when they finally meet another of the same species, they're like, oh, okay. So yeah. here's another, you know, another of the same come, come with us, kind of, yeah. you know, yeah. and, and we'll, we'll, we'll show you the way. Kind of. So it's very welcoming, but it's also a lot of tough love, of course. Um, which is good. You get thick skin early on. You can't take things personally. But yeah. I, I can't help myself but to ask, you know, for any good residency stories when you were in the operating room <laughs> and you said tough love. And is you this just, uh, censored? Uh, yeah. Is this, uh, you, you did something or you thought you were doing the right thing. And then yeah. the next thing you know. Oh, shit. Oh, no. <laughs> this is uh, not good. <laughs> that's, I think that was like every day. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, I mean. I don't know how much of this you could get away today. Uh, unfortunately, I mean, I think you, I got laid into daily. Mm -hmm. It was one of those things where if you didn't do something perfectly, you got screamed at, hollered at until it was perfect. Like perfection was, you couldn't, you know, it was not accept any other alternative to perfection was not acceptable. So you're always chasing that. And, uh, you know, it's grueling, you know, you sleep deprivation up at, you know, four in the morning, three in the morning, two in the morning, or, um, but yeah, getting screamed at every day, uh, told, uh, that you are not intelligent <laughs> but, and not so much of words. Kind yeah. of thing. <laughs> it was crazy though, because you know, you're here, you are, I'm 25 years old, thought I had done pretty well academically, graduated medical school. And here I am as a first year of 10 mm -hmm. and then you have a 10th year person screaming at, can you imagine, you know, kindergarten versus, you know, yeah. <laughs> junior in high school mm -hmm. is that, you know, think of all the, you know, that's what it felt like. And you just were made to feel this small every day, reminder of how much you didn't know. And, um, it was, it was one of those things where I think you either thrive in that environment mm -hmm. or you just totally cave. Mm -hmm. And, um, I don't know. I, I just always clung to the fact, Hey, if these guys could do it, I could do it too. Mm -hmm. That was what, <sighs> and I'm sure you saw plenty cave. Yeah, it was, you have your weak moments, right? You're, there's dark days when you, you know, hey, you made a mistake and, you know, but there is absolutely no way to go through anything, training to be a heart surgeon or training in anything without making mistakes. Like, yeah. There will, mistakes will be made or you're not doing enough. Yeah. Right. So unfortunately you have to kind of roll up the sleeves and go, go, go after it. So, I, so I, where? No, so I was just going to say, and I'm sure he's having fun now. Yeah. in that role <laughs> yeah yeah uh honestly though i mean it's um you know uh, i wrote a book and i, I talk about this a, a, a what's lot. the name of the book a heart to beat uh but there i go back through what i went through and how i feel though in retrospect it was necessary like you have to have this thick skin you have to be told and reminded and shown the right way to do it. And I think, unfortunately, culturally speaking, I would say you can necessarily get away with doing that. I think a lot of us have reverted to a state of uh, uh, error on the side of positive reinforcement mm -hmm. and shy away from negative, you know, because you could, you know, be accused of, uh, I don't know, being excessively mean or yeah. harassing or sure. demeaning. And I was demeaned. That's just, that was just left a standard and right. That was then, like right? baseline. Yeah. I mean, so, so take us take us to uh, you now finish that ten year journey. Yeah, and now it's time to go get a real job. Right. Yeah. Yep. What uh, what happened then? How'd you end up here in Dallas? Well, uh, my first job actually out of training was in Austin, and needless, I was pretty burnt out at the end of my training, uh, as you can imagine. Uh, I talk, I refer to it as a uh, marathon run at a sprinter's pace while simultaneously drinking out of a fire hose. That was what those 10 years were like. And by the end of it, I was kind of tapped out a little bit. And I, the Austin job was uh, an opportunity to join a great group of surgeons that it was felt very f like a fraternity. Mm -hmm laid back, you know, work hard, play hard kind of thing. And I loved it. Uh, I really, it was like a time where I, um, I had completely lost my identity as who I was. My entire identity was wrapped up in this thing that I was learning and training to, to be for a decade. Right. So I had no, I couldn't separate the two. 
and so that job in Austin allowed me to rediscover who I was to get back, you know, get back in shape. I was mm -hmm. totally out of shape, sleep deprived, all that stuff. So it, it was like a rejuvenation. And then once I came to, uh, I realized I still wanted to be on the cutting edge, if you will, yeah. not just this podcast <laughs> 10 years later, but on the cutting edge of heart surgery that I had my pedigree and my experience was to be at the cutting edge places, pushing the envelope, the best of the best, so to speak. And so I kind of felt like I needed to get back into that. So that's what drove me to come back to, to, to Dallas to be at Baylor, where I rejoined some guys that I trained with at Cleveland Clinic. And it was an opportunity to head up the mechanical circulatory support program and the research program at Baylor in Dallas. So I felt like that was my way to get back into um, the whole kind of um, uh, research, innovation, pushing the envelope uh, in my field. So very cool. Yeah. So you're currently at Medical City Heart Hospital mm -hmm. here in Dallas. Right. How did that opportunity arise to uh, to take the helm of the program over there? So after being at Baylor Dallas, I was recruited up to New York. This was in 2017 to uh, lead the first uh, heart transplant program on Long Island. So that was a, a huge challenge and, and opportunity that went well. And after three, three and a half years there, the opportunity to come back to Dallas to take over the program at uh, Medical City became available. I think Medical City was one of the three or is one of the three programs in Dallas that does heart transplant. And so I think they were in a in a position in their trajectory where they wanted to up the ante, they wanted to, you know, increase their their volume, their their standing, their footprint in the field, and so I, you know, uh, I feel completely, um, you know, honored that they had thought of me in that regard, and so uh, the opportunity came, and I and I seized it. So that's awesome, and that you know that kind of takes us to to where we are today. I mean, what are all the different surgical conditions or surgical support areas that you work in? So uh, I still do regular, <laughs> if there's such a thing, yeah. <laughs> heart surgery. Uh, you know, when you typically think of a heart surgery, you think of, you know, bypass surgery uh, to, to reroute, you know, clogged arteries in the heart, uh, replace or fix damaged valves, things like that. That's what I would put under the, the category of bread and butter, you know, uh, heart surgery. But within heart surgery, my niche is in heart failure. So when the heart fails to the point that medicines can't help, conventional surgery can help, then I dedicate a lot of what I do to replacing the heart completely with a transplant. Uh, or there's mechanical heart options that we could use to implant. And then there's also the whole category of, of people that are in shock, meaning Maybe they had a massive heart attack or something, but they are like in in an extremis. Like right now, they need something, and so there's a whole array of things that have evolved devices, things that for the short term to stabilize people who are on the verge of death, like imminently. So that's where I spend a, a good chunk of uh, of my time as a heart surgeon. Interesting. Well, you know, part part of the reason you're here today is to talk about something that's just really yeah. It's brand new to Dallas. It's brand new to Texas. You know. And that's something called DCD transplant. So help frame for our audience, just how many patients are awaiting a heart transplant now? And what is the donor, what's that cycle look like for a patient that's waiting? How long do they wait? So, you know, I like to look, start with the sort of 50,000 foot view. There's probably 300,000 people in the United States that have advanced heart failure that would theoretically benefit from a transplant. Wow. But there's only 3,000 heart transplants done in the whole United States. So 3,000 for what really should be 300,000. So there's a lot of people, thousands of people that die every year waiting for a heart. Uh, even though the mechanical heart stuff has come a long way and does offer a, a good alternative to put a dent in that big number, it still doesn't completely and I don't want to sidetrack us, but on the mechanical heart side, if that is successful, what's the life expectancy for somebody there? Well, it's really the, the pumps themselves work great. And especially the latest uh, iterations, uh, it's really the lights. <clears throat> they're not wireless yet. 
I think that's the biggest, um, I think, obstacle for many people in that it's you're still tethered to some degree to a, a battery, so you can't submerge in water. So for many people, that's quality of life, quality of life thing. Yeah. And uh, they're really only intended to support people that have just left sided failure, which is probably three quarters of people that have heart failure. But there are still 30% uh, of people with heart failure that need complete heart support. It's not just the left side, they need left and right. So that's where transplant would still come in. So there's definitely been a, a large push focus by all of us in our field to say, okay, how can we get more donors? What can we do to increase the donor pool? Are we just being too picky or are there really not enough donors? And so a lot of things have come into play as far as amplifying the pool of donors. And one is um, exploring this idea of using donation after cardiac death. So normally the way heart transplant has been done for decades is it's brain dead donors. So something happens to somebody, they become brain dead, legally, clinically brain dead, meaning a neurologist actually documents that they are brain dead. And if the organs are suitable and the family or the patient had already agreed to be a donor, then it's a controlled donation, meaning it's scheduled. Okay, we're gonna to go to the OR at 10 a.m. The, there's gonna be three different centers flying in to take the different organs and it's a controlled procedure. We get to decide as at what point we stop the heart to, to remove the organs. Donation after cardiac death relates to a whole other subset of people okay, that- so before you go there, in that scenario, yeah. in that controlled scenario, the heart is the last organ to be harvested. First. There's multiple, That's it's the first organ. Okay. Right. But it's all done at the same time, meaning uh, we're all in the room, wow. we open up, and then when everybody's ready, we stop the heart. Okay. And the heart comes out, but then the liver and the kidney and the pancreas and the lungs and all that come out. But it's, there's no period of like instability, meaning we decide exactly at what moment we go from being totally stable, you know, 120 over 80, et cetera, and boom, we, we stop the heart, take the organs. There's no, there's no damage per se because the, you know, but donation after cardiac death is someone has brain injury, whether it was a, a gunshot wound, an overdose, but they're not all the way brain dead, meaning they almost are. They don't have reflexes. They're in a vegetative state. But when a neurologist comes to look at them and examine them, they they have maybe one reflex or something, something that they can't chart that they're brain dead. But it's still such a grim situation uh, prognostically that family is going to withdraw support. So in that instance, we're saying, is it OK if we remove the organs after they've passed away? So it's a completely different situation which you could get away with, with kidney and liver because they're more tolerant of, because you know, you're talking 20 minutes, 30 minutes after they've passed away, getting in there, removing the organs. You could never do that with the heart because the heart is very sensitive. Once somebody dies immediately, that heart's gonna distend because the blood is not being pumped so long. And the heart is very sensitive to being distended like a balloon, it, it can be damaged. So you could never take that heart and use it because you, have, you would have no idea if it's been damaged to the point where it's not going to work mm -hmm. and you just can't take that chance. So how can you then use that heart? And so what we've explored and what's been described by other centers, primarily in the UK, mm -hmm. is, well, what if you go in and you actually resuscitate that heart first? And that's what we've done here uh, at our program in Texas is instead of going in like the other organ teams and just take the organ out and hope for the best, we actually go in and go on the heart lung machine. We connect to the heart lung machine as if we're doing a regular heart surgery. And then once on the heart lung machine, we recirculate blood through the heart and allow it to kind of almost get, you know, flow back to it, resuscitate and revive it. And once we revive it, then we come off the heart lung machine and see if the heart will continue to sustain itself. And when we prove that, then we use that heart for, for transplant. Whoa. <laughs> so, so mind it's, blowing it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a mouthful. It's a lot. It's a long winded okay, so, uh, explanation. So but. you have, and I think this is where you're probably going to go, but yeah. let me see if I can average Joe it. 
you have this particular person of which you have this opportunity, but you've got somebody that needs a heart in Austin. Yeah. Okay. So do you leave it on the heart and lung machine, put it on the plane, then pull it off when you get there? So, so how does that work? I so mean, there's two ways to use a heart from a person that's a DCD. Okay. One way is, and I think is probably what you're describing is, okay, you get in there, you remove the heart and you put it on this external pump, mm -hmm. heart in a box. Mm -hmm. And it's on this little machine that pumps the heart. Mm -hmm. And then you look at it over the course of a couple hours and decide, eh, it looks pretty good. It's beating. There's a blood test that you do on it. And you're like, all right, we'll use that. Well, that's one way to do it. The other way to do it is instead of removing the heart right away when you get in, is to actually do that resuscitation in the chest. So going on the heart lung machine in the chest. Okay. Why would we do that? Well, A, that machine that, that, to, that you would put on that portable machine is not yet FDA approved. It's very expensive, almost $100,000 per. Per procedure. Per Holy procedure. God. And it's also, uh, well, yes, it does work. It's been shown to work in the studies in which it was evaluated. But if you think about doing it in the chest, you're actually going to potentially save the other organs and help the other organs. Because rather than removing that heart, putting it on this machine, and all right, see so you guys now later. Now you're circulating blood through everything. Yeah, now you're circulating blood through everything. Number two, it's not anywhere near as expensive. And number three, it even in the best of hands, taking the heart out, putting it on this fancy machine and doing all that, that's call it 30 minutes, 20 mm -hmm. minutes. When we do this procedure from, op from incising the skin and getting on, we're five minutes. We're moving very quickly, but literally we are in there and recirculating in five minutes. So there's a possibility that maybe the heart is better in the long run more viable because we're getting to it faster and resuscitating it faster than you would using it on this external machine. Now that's not been proven, you know, in a, in a hard, you know, comparative, you know, comparison, but theoretically speaking, one can intuitively feel, okay, that makes mm -hmm. sense. That makes intuitive sense. Why, you know, you're doing that. But the challenge is you are really under the gun. You have to move very, very quickly because yeah. every second, every minute counts. So you really have to have, and you know, we can get into that, but the whole sequence orchestrated so that you're in there. Yeah, and, I mean, your and, team's gotta be highly trained and highly proficient, right? In order for something like that to work. So once it's hooked up, in the case of it being in the chest cavity, yeah. it's hooked up, it's circulating. How does that heart go from there to the recipient? So once you've re resuscitated the heart and the heart looks totally viable, it's beating and you're like, okay, then you almost revert back to the usual way of what we do in the brain dead situation where we go to the OR, it's scheduled and like, okay, everybody ready? We're going to stop the heart and we're going to take all the organs now. So you almost revert back to the customary way of doing it. The challenge though is we're not doing that highly technically challenging specialized procedure at our own hospital, which would be wonderful if we could. We're actually going to wherever the donor is. So to do that, we're bringing our own instruments. We're bringing a bigger team. So we have to bring two perfusionists, the folks that man the heart lung machine for our regular heart surgeries. So all of a sudden you go from in the usual brain dead scenario of a donor, you know, a surgeon will just go to now five people are going, five team members are going. So it's a lot more, you know, manpower, man hours uh, that are being used to do this. But obviously it's worth it, of course, because we're in many, th this would have been an organ otherwise unused. You saved a life. You're saving another life that otherwise wouldn't have been yeah. saved. And we've done six so far. And, you know, we're, I can't emphasize how proud I am of our team because this is yeah. obviously all these folks involved, getting the procedure down, the, get, making sure all of our instruments are there, manning the machine, doing all that stuff. So I, I got it's, a question, right? I mean, you're expanding the donor pool. Right. 
A, what's the potential for how much you could expand the donor pool in this situation if this becomes a standard of care? Well, the best way to answer that is to look at the experience in England and Australia where they've been doing, they actually have been way ahead of us uh, in this regard for some time, probably a decade. And um, what they saw with their transplant volume is it went up almost 30, 40%. Yeah. So, so we're talking another thousand plus patients that could potentially benefit right from this in the united states right which is a huge number right i mean it's it's a tremendous amount of lives impacted right it's uh we'll see what happens i think uh it's it's an exciting time in my field even it's always exciting but this is really exciting because mm -hmm. we're all debating okay how's this going to look you know there's questions that are coming up how are we going to change how we put our teams together. Um, it's, it's, it's really interesting. So, it's rapidly so is there, you know, you have this recipient list, right? There has to be some way to force rank recipients. Does this change who becomes eligible or how that recipient list is worked through because of where the heart is coming from or how it's being harvested or anything like that? It does because since we're the only program that's doing it in Texas, um, actually one of maybe a handful in the entire United States, I would venture maybe five to 10 other centers are doing this in the entire country. When donors become available, when you submit your list of for your mm -hmm. potential recipients, you check that box, whether you're even gonna entertain the idea of a DCD. So there, <clears throat> because very, very few centers in the whole United States have that box checked, we do, so now, all of a sudden we have organs that become available to us that people lower on our list are coming up now because these hearts no one's taken them it's so it's, the patient selected yeah that they that they would accept we've transplanted people that are really you know for our own internal list they're low on our list but they're coming up because we're going well we have this heart and no one's taken it we're going to go after it and We've done pretty, you know, low status people, which is great. So I, I got it. I'm all about stories because I got to hear about this. You've done six. Mm -hmm. I'm sure there's one of the six that are most memorable. If it's not the first one, because the, that's the first one you had to be on pins and needles. I mean, yes, huge moments. So can you tell us a little bit about that? Give us a little insight. Yeah, it's because um, it's one of these things you um, you can't practice it. You don't know because you know uh, there have been a couple centers that have really led the the, the charge on this. You know Vanderbilt, and they, you know they published their results in, in their first ten. And you're reading the protocol. You're like, okay, you know, you do this and this. You open and you you know, and they were talking about five minutes or three minutes. And I'm like, okay, so, but it's not till you're in there and actually, I've never had to do that on someone that's already dead. Like you're opening, it's it's the most surreal thing. You're opening and there's no blood loss. There's nothing's bleeding, nothing's moving. The heart's distended, like a you know. And uh, Golly, I never even thought about that, right? Because the person's passed away, there is no bleeding. You don't have to worry about suction. You don't have to worry about right. And it's technically challenging because the heart is so distended. You're trying to get to, in you know, very quickly, get to areas that you're gonna try to make an opening and connect to and this and that. So it's very, it's technically much more challenging than one can appreciate by just looking at the, the, the protocol. And you're like, oh, and it's each time we do it, we, another thing we, we pick up like, oh, okay, for the next time we're gonna do this differently and that differently. But yeah, the very first one we're like, okay, you know, this is, um, we waited, we were ready to go for probably a good three months, but we wanted our first one to be local. We wanted it so that our teams could drive, you know, mm -hmm. to our local facility because we really wanted to make sure we had the protocol down. Mm -hmm. Once we felt comfortable that we've been venturing out, we've been flying away to as far away as, you know, 500 miles away, 100 miles away, just because our, our, our team has gotten more confident with. with That's uh, good. Does the hospital handle all that? They just put you on a plane out of wherever and. Yeah. Yeah. It's all I mean. Uh, it's all really tightly orchestrated. Um, you know, they, they charter private jets sure. and we all, you know, it's, it's very glamorous. <laughs> Not really. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but um, no, it's, 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 it has to be that way because, you know, we were under the gun because the heart we have, to, ideally you want the heart sewn in, you know, 
out of the body sewn in in under four hours. So wow. that, in, that includes the time that it takes to remove it from the from the donor, transport it back, sew it in. That's you really want that. The benchmark is four hours. It's not like the heart you know expires at four hours, but generally speaking, if you go above four hours, there's an increased chance that the heart may not work as well. So the furthest she flown is where? Uh, Colorado. We flipped Colorado. How much notice? How much time did you all get to prep for this one? Or? Yeah, and the one thing I will say about um, transplant and stuff like that, it's very, they have to place all the organs. So when I accept the heart, they still have to place the liver and the kidney and the pain. So often it takes hours to place the other organs and then come up with an OR time, you know, where all four or five different centers, you know, Pittsburgh, Cleveland, LA, you know, we're all going to descend upon this hospital in the middle of nowhere and wherever at the same exact time and all go to the OR at the same exact time. So generally there is a good amount of lead time. Mm -hmm. I'd say eight to 12 hours usually, mm -hmm. uh, sometimes less, sometimes more, but um, it's never like, okay, there's a heart available. We need, you need to go like right now. Yeah. You know, so there is, a, there is a good amount of time to orchestrate stuff. So is it the Maybe. same, is it the same surgical team that's harvesting the organ that's then placing it in the recipient or are there two different teams set up to do those functions? Uh, well, you know, in our experience, uh, in about half of them, I would go get the heart and then my surgical partner would implant them. The other half, I did all of it, meaning I went, got it, and then sewed it in. Um, but you still have to have, you know, your partner because because of the time constraints, you want to be able to walk into the OR with the heart and have the other heart ready to come out. So that means the heart, the, uh, the chest is open, ready to go. Yeah. So you want that you want that exchange to be seamless because you don't want to waste any time. Yeah, man, the coordination to be able to do this kind of stuff. I, you know, I, I've never thought about it twice, right? The only thing, only time I've ever considered yeah. anything about organ transplant is on my driver's license. Hey, do you want to do it or don't? Sure, you? yeah, right? absolutely. Right. That's exactly what I was thinking earlier. I was like, absolutely, of course, I want to do that. But yeah, there's a lot to it. But yeah, I mean, it's <clears throat> it is it's wildly intricate. I mean, you know, so you've done six successfully. Mm -hmm. How many opportunities have you had, and what would cause? Uh, what would cause you to say this heart's not suitable or this patient's not suitable and you had to back away? Well, you know, there's there's a couple things. Uh, on, there's a chance that after you've reconnected and re resuscitated the heart, that the heart just doesn't look viable, meaning it, you, you can't have any shadow of doubt from, from your clinical judgment that, you know, that heart's going to function well. So there's scenarios like that where you're like, ah, oh, the heart just doesn't, it just doesn't look like it's going to do well. So you don't want to take that risk. And then secondly, sometimes, believe it or not, these folks that aren't brain dead, support is withdrawn and they don't pass. Meaning an hour goes by, two hours go by and they don't die. And so in which case then, obviously, yeah, we abort, we back out. And then uh, the patient, the, the, the donor is kept, you know, goes back to, I guess, their the ICU room or whatever. And uh, so there's always a chance. It's not a, so we have to also make that judgment based on how many reflexes the individual has. Okay, what's the likelihood? And it's sometimes really not entirely 100% accurate. We're going to fly our whole team out, yeah, you know, right? a thousand I mean, miles away. And then for it to be a dry run where at the end, the person does it. Uh, so we've had a couple of those. And then sometimes that's just the nature of it that, you know, you're going to have those types of things happen. So, wow, that's, uh, yeah, you, ne you never think about the folks that, yep, we got a candidate and you go, uh, nope, sorry. Yeah. And is, I mean, yeah. is there ever a situation where you say, hey, we have a viable candidate? I guess when it, it really, it's all decided with the heart, right? I mean, it, it, is there a situation where you go and you guys get in there and you go, man, the heart's not viable, but the rest of the organs are? Oh, yeah. That happens a lot. Um, the other organ teams go through that, too. They may open and say, ooh, the liver, we don't like the way the liver looks. So we'll do a biopsy or... Um, and I prep patients for that. So I'll, I'll say, hey, look, you know, we're not going to commit to anything. 
one of our big, obviously, checkpoints is until our donor team directly visualizes that heart and it looks as good in person as it did on paper, are we going to commit? Mm-hmm. So um, S is part of it. And um, it's our responsibility to make sure we don't, you know, make those uh, judgment errors. Um, so sometimes so you, you don't, don't know until you're there. Sure. One of the questions I have is, you know, they withdraw life support. The patient passes. Is there is there a certain amount of time that in your clinical judgment you go, look, we're going to allow this person to be deceased for four minutes before we're going to start this process, right? Because right? could could the heart restart on its own after technically it's deceased? Is right. That- so there's um, and because this is so this is rapidly evolving, mm-hmm. there's some absolute criteria or criteria that have kind of been in place for some time because mind you the liver and kidney transplant community have been using these donors for decades and generally speaking one of the time points is okay after support is withdrawn meaning you know they take the breathing tube out and you sometimes it's immediate five minutes the person expires but sometimes they they stay you know they're not going flatline. They're holding their blood pressure. So <clears throat> hour, hour and a half for most, again, this is not written in stone, but generally speaking, somewhere between an hour and hour and a half, depending on the program, we'll say, okay, if they've not gone flatline within that time, we're going to back out. Because then the, the supposition there is that the organs, the heart in particular or whatever, will have sustained too much damage. And we don't want to take the mm-hmm. chance. So there is some period of time after which you kind of have to make the judgment call. Are we going to back out uh, or are we going to are we going to stick around for two hours? And sometimes it's not we're not absolutely dogmatic about it. Sometimes it's a it's a gut feeling. How what are how good of a donor do we believe it is or how how sick is our recipient? Sometimes, you know, we have recipients that, hey, if if we can't make this organ work, this may be their last shot. Right. Yeah. So there's a lot riding on that call uh so it's a case by case and we're still learning as we go because it's still so new for us has there been any difference in mortality with recipients whether they get a heart from a traditional donor or they get a heart from a dcd donor is there any literature that says no the the data so the all the uk data shows that the outcomes are equivalent in the initial study done here in the united states using that heart in the box technology. Uh, and that study closed about a year ago or six months ago. Preliminarily speaking, that data looks like it's also gonna show the same thing, that mm-hmm. it's, there's no difference. So I'm confident that there is no difference. And I can say anecdotally in our experience with the six, these hearts have all been amazing. I mean, really, you know, because also, uh, obviously we're being very selective uh, of, of sort of what kind of heart, what kind of donor, you know, they're younger, otherwise healthy type of, so those hearts have been very, very rigorous. I mean, you're vigorous. You're the kind of guy, it's obvious you're, you're bright enough and smart enough that you could have done anything you wanted to do. You could have done the, you know, bread and butter surgeries all day, every day, made great money, lived a great life. Why'd you choose to be a trailblazer and do it like this? Um, I don't know. I, I think it's, I don't necessarily look at it as um, wanting to um, necessarily be a trailblazer, but it's just uh, an area that really uh, is exciting because I feel like it's um, it's the sickest people. It's the sickest of the sick. It's people that have run out of options. They're, you know, they have no other out. And I feel like... Um, as a field, that's also the most exciting part of the field because it's so it's constantly evolving, new devices, new things to help more and more people. Um, I'm I'm uh, partial to heart failure because I feel like it's it's probably one of the most challenging uh, and underappreciated clinical illnesses that affects everyone, all of you know our population. You know. People are sick of hearing me make this comparison, but it's deadlier than most cancers, yet it's not thought of when, you know, when someone says, oh, someone so has heart failure. 
it's not the same. It doesn't uh, elicit the same reaction. It's also yeah. until it's cancer. Like, ooh, wow, that's mm-hmm. terrible. Yeah, I never thought about that. And that's, I mean, but most I, I, heart failure is deadlier than most cancers. And so part of my passion and, and, and why is I want to change that. Mm-hmm. And I think that this all goes along with that, meaning um, doing more, trying to get more uh, help, treatment, therapy, options, hope um, for these patients. But don't get me wrong, I, do, I love operating. Uh, my, my happy place is the operating room. And so everything makes sense in the operating room. The outside world <laughs> often does not. Does not make sense. It's yeah. like so, a safe place. So I like operating. And so I, as much as I could be in there, that's that's where I'd yeah, rather, totally rather understandable, be. Right? We all yeah. want to be where we're most comfortable. Uh, that's cool. I like that. <laughs> the million dollar question literally is: What's the cost of a heart transplant? Uh, just ballpark. I mean, are we talking fifty thousand, two hundred fifty thousand, a million dollars? Like. For the average Joe, me included, right? I have no idea what a procedure, a, a heart transplant could potentially cost. Right. You know, not to give a, not to be a, you know, a politician. That's a difficult answer to give in the sense that uh, it depends on your insurance, what your out-of-pocket expense, et cetera. But I mean, it's definitely in the more million dollar range, probably, at least as far as what the costs are, because it's also, um, you have to remind yourself of the fact that it's okay. You have the surgery, the transplant itself, but then there's lifelong care associated with that. The yeah, all yearly, the yearly, the, all the anti-rejection drugs, the yearly checkups to make sure that mm-hmm. that heart doesn't reject in the long term. So, um, we're always hyper vigilant about the rejection of the heart that may happen. So, I, I have a, another question. Um, I'm in an industry that honestly is getting more challenging because of this exactly, being able, the, the technology and the advancements in healthcare. As a matter of fact, uh, my job is to help folks make sure they have enough money before they you know, pass away, that they're able right. to achieve their goals. And we academically have been pressed uh, to start looking at uh, mortality rates of 101 and 103 now for uh, men and women. What are your thoughts on that? That's a big change from 91 to 93 over 20 years. And now that's changing. What are your thoughts on how quickly things are advancing that would uh, correlate to that type of macro change? Well, we have a growing elderly population. So heart failure is growing and growing and growing. I think by the year 2030, uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of 10 million Americans are going to have some degree of heart failure. Mm -hmm. So I think heart failure in particular is going to have impact on every single branch of medicine, no matter how far removed on paper it might seem from, from that, you know, type of disease process. So at the same time, part of the reason why there's so many people with heart failure and the reason is that we're doing a much better job globally as a field in cardiology and heart medicine, we're keeping people alive longer with heart disease. You know, so it goes, it comes down to the corny analogy of, you know, you have a a car that you do everything by the book, oil changes and, you know, all the different things and all the different mileage, you know, benchmarks. But at some point, you know, after a certain number of miles, the car is just going to give out, the engine is just going to give out. And I think that's sort of, in one respect, how this is evolving in the heart, in the heart field. So people are going to be, you know, we're always debating, okay, is 70 or 75 too old for a heart transplant? Should we, what about an artificial heart pump? Can we, you know, there's, there have been series published of heart pumps, LVADs and oxygenarians. So there's always that judgment call, like how old is too old? What's the life but, expectancy? But that conversation wasn't happening 10 years ago. No. You wouldn't even have considered it. For a 75 year old then right right no yeah. i mean historically a lot of programs if once you hit 65 that was it there's not even a debate for heart transplant well now you know 70s is very much in yeah. play uh, as far as candidacy yeah. that's, that's fascinating yeah super fascinating well you know we have buzzed through a, 
almost an hour here, which has been awesome, right? Because there's been so much that we've learned and I'm sure our audience has too. Yeah, I would love you to share final thoughts. You know, how, where, where is the next frontier? If you could potentially predict, mm -hmm. where is it? And then we'd love to know how people can find you. Sure. So um, I think the next frontier for um, treating heart failure surgically, which is my niche, is the development of wireless heart pumps. And a lot of that has to do with battery technology. So when they can figure out how to create a battery that can power something, a pump, you know, these pumps deliver five liters a minute of flow. That's a very powerful pump. And that has to be constant, constant, constant. There isn't a battery that exists right now on planet Earth that could do that. You have to charge it in some way. So hence why these things aren't wireless yet. But there's a race against time right now um, by the bigger, you know, industry companies and things like that of who can develop that technology. And that technology is going to have far reaching uh, implications on everything we in tech, right? How we charge our phones and sure. other devices and et cetera. Pacemakers, I'm assuming. Yeah. yeah. So pacemakers can last, you know, 10 years, 20 years. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that next breakthrough is going to be when we can develop smaller wireless heart pumps, because mm -hmm. then you could schedule it. Uh, you know, you won't have this issue of um, waiting for a heart transplant or being maybe a bit discouraged or turned off from the idea of having this tethering that may mm -hmm. impact, you know, negatively impact your, your quality of life. I think that's gonna be the next big breakthrough. Or, you know, Marilyn just did that pig transplant in a human. I'm not sure how how that's yeah, gonna man, compete. That's, but, that's great. Now uh, that, that patient passed away it, yeah. just recently, right? Yes, I think after about three months, I think still the fact that they were able to do that and sustain patient's life for three months is remarkable. I think yeah. there's still some challenges there, but I think what's probably more imminently realistic is the mechanical alternative being perfected to the point that it's wireless. Um, it's easy to find me. I, uh, it's, it's Brian Lima MD, pretty much in every different as, you know, aspect of, uh, of social media, whether it's Instagram, Facebook, uh, LinkedIn, it's Brian Lima MD. Not TikTok though. I've not yet. <laughs> yes. uh, well, are, I knew I I'll, I'll give you a ton of credit. So <laughs> the the surgeons I had on on the last episode who are in orthopedic surgery, yeah, they're like, "What's social media?" <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's, right. You're uh, you're kind of you're, you're the opposite of yeah. that. Like you're you're uh, you're very active, which I suspect your patients love, right? Because you're you're accessible, which yeah. I, I believe That's pretty rare. I take pride in that. I mean, I think patients uh, can us usually get a quick read on me. And then mm -hmm. um, uh, there's a lot of stuff online that they can find about, mm -hmm. you know, me and stuff. So I think that's comforting for patients. They can, you know, okay, who's this guy? What's going on? I mean, it's a scary thing having or being told you need heart surgery or something like that. So justifiably so they want to know, okay, who's this person that's going to be doing his, you know, life-threatening surgery on my loved one, right? So I, I respect that. So I try to populate as much as I can out there about what I've done and um, and what I offer for patients. I give every patient and their family my cell phone. Um, oh, whoa, whoa. I, wait, hang on a second. I do. You give uh, every yeah. patient and their family yeah, your it's cell on, phone. It's no, it's I, I can't get surgeons to give me their cell phone number and I can serve them professionally. <laughs> <laughs> well, they don't like to give each other. Uh, no, just it's on kidding. my business card and I, and I, you know, it's generally, I would say the vast majority of times they never, people respect, it. people respect that. There's a few exceptions, but <laughs> that's okay. Mm -hmm. But I mean, I think it's, I want them to feel like, Hey, I'm not, you know, uh, this is not wizard of Oz. I'm not mm -hmm. some, you know, elusive kind of, I, I'm, I'm, this is a big deal. What and do you, so, what do you enjoy doing when you're not in an operating room? I'm a bit of a foodie. Good. Yeah. That's uh, fun. I, uh, so this whole surgery thing is like plan B football was the original. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Clearly that didn't work out, <laughs> but, uh, I love sports. So, you know, and we're exercising and things like that. I was a, a gym rat back in my high school days. Cool. So uh, I like doing that. that. That helps me blow off some steam. Have you, have you, uh, converted yourself to Dallas sports or are we still up North? Actually, I, I root for the Cowboys. Oh, the wow. Yeah, yeah. Well, that was the is last it, team here anyone, I thought you were going to say. Is anyone from New Jersey and you're going to see this? Because uh, <laughs> <laughs> I might be like a marked man now, but it's okay. No. 
I love the Cowboys. Awesome, man. I mean, this is this has been fascinating yeah. for us. Great for our audience. Thank you. Can't thank you enough. You know, you're you are a man in demand. And uh, oh yeah, legend in my own mind. As I like to say, <laughs> there you go, Brian. Yeah. We all are. So well, we know you. We know your yeah. administrator Rita helps to keep you grounded too. Oh, yeah. So uh, we thank Rita if you're watching this. We thank you for that. Thank so, you, Rita. <laughs> uh, man, you know, I, I think that's it for this episode. Uh, it's been a hell of a ride. Uh, it's not often you people can put me on on my heels, but this has <laughs> definitely done it. Like this is. This is uh, this is something I want to talk about. I, I don't think CJ about. needs a heart transplant from a medical standpoint. There's some other things we'll talk about. It just his uh, poor soul, but we'll, we'll get yeah, to that later. It's okay. We, uh, we'll find the help you need, my man. Yeah. <laughs> so, hey, everybody, appreciate you for, uh, for watching. And uh, find us on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, LinkedIn, uh, all of those social media outlets. And until uh, next time, tune in.